So, hey, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. We're really excited to speak with you. Uh, I'm Zach. I'm Gavin. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, welcome to the podcast. Uh, So you're running for U.S. Congress to represent California's uh, uh, 34th District. Uh, Could you just introduce yourself to listeners and tell us a little bit about your campaign against the incumbent, uh, Jimmy Gomez? Yes, for sure. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, Zach and Gavin. Um, So my name is David Kim. For those who are listening for the first time, I'm running in 34th CD in Los Angeles. We cover downtown Los Angeles, all of it, um, including Little Tokyo, Arts District, Chinatown, uh, the parts a little southern as well. And then including uh, Koreatown, Boyle Heights, Lincoln Heights, Highland Park, uh, Westlake, Pico Union, uh, Eagle Rock, Glassell Park, and just surrounding neighborhoods. And I'm running to unseat the corporate incumbent, Jimmy Gomez. Um, he, while he currently pockets money from pharmaceutical companies, healthcare companies, uh, prison money, police union money, developers, industrial complex, all of that, our people continue to suffer uh, financially. We are the 10th poorest congressional district in the nation. Uh, We have per capita incomes of $15,000 to $12,000 in certain parts of our district. The average rent for one bedroom apartment is $1,800 a month. We have two families living in one bedroom apartments. Uh, We have 46,000 plus brothers and sisters living unhoused in the city. Those are our new numbers that came out. Um, Yet, no change is being done. And so um, at this time, we just can't afford wasting another two years to reelect an official and expect different results. And so that's why I'm running. Yeah, totally. Um, so something you're running on, you're, you're a humanity forward candidate. Um, a lot of, you know, the Yang gang types have really uh, solidified around your campaign and really enthusiastic. And uh, Zach and I have actually been debating recently a lot the merits of a universal basic uh, income, a policy that, you know, of course, Andrew Yang championed. And, and you're carrying on that uh, fight. It's something that you're championing in your own uh, bid for Congress. Um, and mm-hmm. I think that the way you're approaching it is the, the exact correct way, you know, uh, applying it in tandem with, you know, programs to make sure that we end ha- homelessness and Medicare for all other programs to make sure that we, um, you know, float up the bottom uh, tiers of society to make sure that they also enjoy the same rights as everyone else. Uh, so, yeah, we just wanted to uh, hear a little bit more from you about UBI and how, especially in your district, you know, it could be a meaningful stepping stone towards a more humane society, a society where people aren't forced to slave away at their shitty job. Uh, How do you envision UBI being administered here in America? Yeah. Um, And for those, I'm just going to set a timer because I have a tendency. I'm getting used to this whole interview thing, guys, because I'm a first time candidate, to be honest. So, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm as, I'm as honest and real as it can be. So I'm setting a timer. Um, yeah, no problem. <laughs> but yes, UBI, I mean, just as what I had um, shared earlier, UBI would be so life empowering to our communities because like I said, per capita incomes of 12 to 15,000 in our districts, like, that would double their income level. That would be able to allow them. Um, I was in, in different communities. I talked to a lot of people. Nobody, they, they're all taking care of their parents and their children, but they're not getting paid for taking care of their parents and their children. And, and like they're not being paid for that value or being recognized for it. And so that would help a lot of families and even allow them to start having savings because none of the families here are able to live on any savings, to be honest. It's all just debt or living month to month or working two to three jobs to do that. And just like what Gavin had said, like we're, we're not human beings on this earth to like work and toil like ants till the day we die and then, and then have our last breath and leave. Like that's not what life's supposed to be. And, and I know this sounds radical, but like, why don't we have like a life where just one job is enough where like sometimes you can take, Fridays off like a few weeks and like why 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 can't we have that and like in other countries they do like why and some people that might be hearing this might say might think wow that's pretty radical David but no it's not like we've been brainwashed and programmed to think that we're only valuable if we have economic work value in terms of pumping out stuff for whoever our employers are and if in the sense of if you were to actually think of the government prioritizing entrepreneurship as a thing as as growing your own thing being your own voice and empowering that oh my gosh so many different programs would already be in place for that and and to to help allow for that and because and because there's a lack of that like we have a lot of young talented people or even older talented people having these great talents and skills to be able to use but not knowing where to go and how to start 
uh, being screwed here, being screwed there, uh, spending their resources here and there without knowing what to do. And, and I think it's now it's a time for us to really prioritize and say, hey, what are things that can help our people thrive? And I think that's one of my key, key things is what can we do to help our communities thrive? What do they want? To help their own families thrive and i think that's the conversation that needs to be had so for ubi if we were to able able to do that that'd be amazing and going back to gavin's point that he had pointed out was um in regards to no nobody's benefits would be taken away the carpet sh won't be taken out from under you under you because that's very important um resources and benefits that you are currently living on and continue to need to live on and and so it's it's just a, it's the creating a floor for everyone to be able to stand on and and to work from and so that also allows for um somebody like myself um we grew up on a lot of safety net programs growing up and and it also removes the stigma of it even and i and i and i'm just speaking from my immigrant community upbringing experience in our own immigrant communities like we could all know like we all knew if that family was receiving welfare or this family was but we would never talk about it because it was so shameful for us and so there's so many benefits with having a ubi um and and there's a lot to point out whether it be you're trapped in your minimum wage job and you don't have time to go ahead and learn new skills um that you need um you don't have uh the money to pay for a coding boot camp that could actually change your life for the better um and and to be able to do that and that's where our leaders really need to start or if you're an artist oh. you know and you want to uh be able to do your art and you know express yourself at the same time while you're you know leading yeah. a different life that it, it, it gives people the freedom to do that sorry zach i didn't mean to cut you off oh no yeah um, one of the i just wanted to point out gavin mentioned that we'd uh, sort of been debating ubi i want to say that it's i don't have any sort of disagreement that the universal basic income would be would massively improve the quality of life for these people but i did want to ask you uh, one of my fears about uh, implementing a UBI system is that we're not confronting the economic system that produces the issue in the first place. Um, so the primary narrative behind implementing a universal basic income is that it's going to offset automation. Um, but I feel like it, it might be putting a uh, Band-Aid on a shotgun wound, you know, creating a permanent gap between the owner class and the people that will rely on this income. Uh, how would you, uh, you know, create a society where we don't just have an even deeper divide where it's people who rely on this universal basic income or face unemployment due to automation and people who are in the owner oligarch class who are collecting all of the, um, you know, money from the automation? And that's where we need to really prioritize having everybody pay their fair share. I think, um, I think when we, when we bundle certain things that we haven't already been doing into the picture of UBI. And that's why, um, I mean, I'm not saying that's what you're saying, that that's why we can't do it. But I think we need to really take apart each puzzle piece that you've like presented. So in the sense of how do we ensure that we don't have this divide of a community of uh, communities of people just living on UBI, having this sort of lower level of living limited to what their ubi can afford them and having automation take out everything like that's going to be a serious problem if you think about it as well because then you're creating an even more divided society in that sense and so those are great issues and policies to to start talking about and thinking about now and so it's finding ways to go ahead and that but one of the strong ways to start doing that is is by making people pay their fair share so whether it be by wealth tax whether it be by VAT tax and so these are the first mechanisms that we need to start on or whether it be with capital gains tax um, and so in in all of these different ways that's where we really need to to start calling the shots and not be afraid to to call the shots and and the reason why we have elected officials that are afraid to call the shots right now is because they're they're the source of their money is so deep into these different corporate pockets. That's why they're not able to do that. And so we need more people, whether or not you like AOC or not, like that's fine. But we need more people that are freshman representatives running into Congress, running for Congress, because our allegiance, the reason why we don't accept any money is because once you start doing and this is where my mom, I love her to death, but this is where my mom, although she did <laughs> hit and beat me too much to enforce that rule or that lesson um but but it's once you steal you i mean she she would tell me once you steal it's easier to steal and like so she was like that's why i'm spanking you even more for you to prevent you from stealing ever again or like and so like it worked i mean 
I, that's a whole nother topic spanking like i don't abuse, i don't believe in physical abuse i still have trauma from that i'm not condoning that at all but it's just it's to say that um it's important like once you start drawing a line and this is why we've decided to take no PAC money as opposed to not just corporate PAC money because where do you just start drawing the line I don't want to do that like when when somebody's trying to argue like where to draw the line on that it's like no I don't want to take money from any PACs we're just going to take it from the people because well, that makes it cleaner that way and we're 100% allegiance to the people yeah um, uh, does your opponent Jimmy Gomez does he subscribe to a similar philosophy does he uh, only take small dollar donations no, um, he ninety-eight point eight percent of his money is from big money donors, and of that, six hundred thousand of his eight hundred thousand are from corporate packs. Oh, really? one, I don't want to pivot too hard, but one of the um, things that I uh, about your campaign that I found personally inspiring is, you know, especially in a city like Los Angeles, that where it's so devastated by homelessness. I mean, it has the most uh, concentrated air, my, strip of homelessness in the country, Skid Row. Um, and the way that you've, uh, you know, put up at the front of your campaign, you know, ending homelessness. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that policy. Yeah. So going with our, um, if you go to our website, davidkim2020.com, uh, there are, before I, there are five campaign policies that are on the top. And the reason why they're at the top is not because they're more important than any other issue. I mean, there's ones that need to be, are more time sensitive for sure. Uh, but I don't think that any one area is more important than the other they're all equally important it's just a matter of timing factors involved but the reason why those are the top five issues is every elected official when you when when gavin or zach i don't know if you guys are in relationships or not but when you tell your partner you love them like they're not just going to believe you at your word they want to see something whether it be an act of service or like a gift or kind words or touch the, there's five love languages oh time is the fifth one so they they want something to show for it so when our elected officials say hey we're ruling for the people like show us what does that look like so for for our campaign it's hey we should make sure that like we're not doing handouts like like people get this whole idea boy you we're not encouraging handouts like you shouldn't do that we're not talking about that but it's ensuring that we have a system where people don't have to worry about getting good food they don't have to worry about getting good access to health care and education. They don't have to worry about getting access to a roof and room to sleep under. And, and it's not impossible to do. And, and they don't have to worry about pay, paying basic expenses. And so what does that look like? And so when you have UBI, when you have Medicare for all, when you have Green New Deal, when you have a homes guarantee, when you have a human centered economy. So those are our top five issues. And for if I don't know what your backgrounds on Andrew Yang are, but um, so for Andrew Yang, he had a policy called human-centered capitalism. Yeah, we wanted to ask you about that. You seem to have picked up the torch for that. Yeah, so we actually took out the word capitalism, and it's not to say that... Um, human-centered economy. It's human-centered economy, because really, like, for our local communities here in Los Angeles, we're very triggered by certain words. We're triggered. One of those triggering words is capitalism. And it's not to say... I was just on a different podcast where um, I was talking about capitalism and socialism, and I don't think it's a black-and-white thing. I think it's realizing what factors cause this capitalism to be this form of capitalism where we have now, where only a few are participating and the majority shut out, like what happened and kind of tracking that and not, and seeing what happened along those lines and addressing that. So um, I'm not going to go do that in here, but for us, one of the triggering words is capitalism because the result of that in our communities are per capita incomes of 12 to $15,000 and the rent increasing. So that's the result that we have. So that's a very triggering word in our communities. And so, and, and I know that that policy isn't about supporting and cheerleading and, and increasing capitalism. That's not what it is for those who are listening and hearing it for the first time. Go read Andrew Yang's version of it, go read ours. But it's really focused on measuring our country's success and condition and status and where it is based on factors that really are related and directly related to health. So what does that look like? Instead of measuring a country on their stock market or their GDP in this pandemic, it's unreal, but our stock market was pretty high. And, and we have a lot of millionaires and billionaires making a lot of money in addition to all of the tax breaks that were offered in the CARES Act. And, and our elected officials, probably my opponent, had has no clue what tax break he signed away. Um, so it's just this complete irresponsibility that's happening in that sense. And so for the human-centered economy, it's really bringing it back to the needle of, hey, we're humans, we matter. Let's measure our country on 
average life length expectancy on happiness levels, on marriages, on um, suicide rates, and and mental health counseling and marriage counseling and and all of that, and where it's bringing it back to the home of who we are as a human being. Um, so that's why I I'm I'm huge I'm huge fans of um, Andrew. Uh, Yang, Marianne Williamson, Tulsi Gabbard, and Bernie Sanders. Yeah, same. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about is just like uh, what what exactly has been the reaction from people you've uh, you know talked to about these ideas? You've said that you know capitalism is a very triggering word, and your communities have have, have people really felt the need and expressed the need to uh, transition to a less capitalist society, especially as we've seen the coronavirus pandemic you know ravage the working class and the the most of the benefits from the CARES Act and subsequent legislation being. Uh, you know, funneled straight to the top 1%? Yeah. Um, well, in regards to locally, our community, nobody has any, I mean, yes, we do. I take that back. We do have Republican constituents who, um, and I'm not saying Republican to label them out or anything. My parents are Republican. They're pro-Trump. They're, they think he's a prophet of God. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so, so it's it's not so there are we there are Republican constituents more cons, ultra conservative constituents who who are who call who have called me a socialist before and I'm, and I'm fine with that because I don't I I know that I'm I'm who I am I don't know if I'm a capitalist or socialist but I know who I am and if you think that what I'm preaching and fighting for the people is socialist then I'll leave you to your opinion that's your opinion that's your free speech. I'm not gonna fight with that. That's your speed, free speech. That's your universe and world. Why do I need to go into your universe and world and try to change what you believe? Uh, unless, it's, unless it's something where, hey, you're letting an open conversation and dialogue to be had, then I'll go ahead and have that conversation with you. But I think um, for us, our tendency is to be very reactionary and to draw lines amongst ourselves. And, to say, and, and that's, that's, that's a natural reaction of our amygdala because our amygdala going back into the Stone Age cavemen days where we were afraid of being eaten alive by animals. And so we would use our amygdala to protect us from these fears. Right now, we don't have those fears. So what are the fears that we have? To be not labeled, to be not canceled, to look cool, to have the right opinion. And so we draw these lines of, oh, you support whatever, or you're capitalist, I'm not talking with you. You're socialist, I'm not talking with you. And then we just sort of set up these boundaries and, and and yes, they're to protect us because our amygdala is reacting, but this is where our mental health care is so important, where we need to realize, hey, let's actually focus on the deeper issues that we all agree on first, and let's see what those are, and then let's start building up instead of drawing these walls up and then saying we're not talking with each other and we're just going to push each of our own agendas. Because imagine how much more change would happen if all of these walls were down and we worked together and said, oh, these are the common things. Okay, let's actually move this forward. We actually moved five steps forward instead of zero steps forward, trying to push our own agendas. And and I think that's that could be something easier said than done. But I think right now we're at a time and climate where whoever's elected into the next wave and the next class of Congress, it's not going to be a quiet Congress. We're going to have a more noisy, a noisier, a more... Um, self-opinionated and really uh, and, uh, and uh, powerful class that will be incoming and, and I hope to be a part of that. Um, yeah, David, one of the questions I had for you um, is specifically in reference to, in regards to your home state of California, is uh, the battle that's going on between gig workers and their uh, employers, specifically companies like Uber and Lyft, uh, on the ballot in November at a state level is Prop 22, which uh, would basically create a third class of workers to be um, in my view, you know, almost exploited by the, um, you know, ride sharing, uh, courier, you know, gig economy companies. And there's been a lot of pushback. You know, uh, just earlier this week, the Massachusetts attorney general also, um, sued Uber and Lyft for violating their, um, state legislation. I just wondered at a federal level, um, do you, um, do you think there's anything that we can do to, um, you know, mandate the recla the classification of employees and uh, do you believe that gig workers should be classified as full-time employees yeah and that's a that's definitely now we're going more into constitutional as well um in the sense of because labor and employment is is generally a state kind of thing like whether or not you're an independent contractor versus an employee so it right. is it is more state legislature based but there are of course like that doesn't mean that federal elected officials can't have an opinion on that and and fight for certain things where when they are 
um, granting these disbursements or bailouts to to go ahead and really command, hey, these are the conditions if we do give you this money or if we do help you out or if we do work in this ways. And it's to realize that our elected officials do have a lot of power. There, there are, I'm, I wasn't gonna cuss, there are freaking elected officials. Um, there are officials, they have so much power, but they're giving away their power to corporate interests, to CEOs. They're giving away their power to out of this fear in their mind of, oh no, I'm gonna lose this if I act this way. I'm gonna lose all of this if I do this. And mm -hmm. so, so for, for the federal elected officials, they can definitely do something. I haven't actually thought, to be honest, Zach, to a degree of what could be done federally. But since you did bring it up, because for me, it's always been a state issue, and I, I have been tracking it. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, when AB5 was first an issue and Lorena Gonzalez had passed it uh, with all of that, me being an attorney, it, the first thing that I thought was, you just fucked up all my singer-songwriter clients and all of them who, like, they depended on freelancing and whatnot, and now they're not able to get a job and they have to go form companies and have insurance and all of this. And so I think even with that, like, our elected officials don't do enough due diligence to see, although this is a well-intentioned thing for our Uber drivers, how about certain people that work in the entertainment industry where it works against them? What are we doing there and balancing that out? So I think... Um, but but I'm 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 hopeful that the people will be able to make a great decision, good decision on that. Given For example, would you be in support of in a legislation sort of like the Fair Labor Standards Act, including Uber drivers, to mandate that they uh, receive the same paid sick leave? Or for Uber drivers, for Uber drivers, and if if it's that specific type where we're able to sure, go just ahead I, I, I'm, right. more, I'm trying to gauge uh, where your opinion is at on the matter, more out of curiosity. Okay, just on uh, just on. Um, uh, a policy matter rather than practical. But yes, I, I totally, because I I actually drove for Lyft and Uber from 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. every day when I was doing that two to three job hustle and grind. And I didn't have health insurance. I paid more gas and mileage than what I was getting paid. Um, so I understand the real struggle of it. And so maybe it's because it was personal to me that I have that position, but that's what I experienced. And what I experienced didn't feel right. And I didn't think it was right for a lot of my fellow drivers. Yeah. Uh, do you, just out of curiosity, do you think there is, uh, you know, more room for companies like Uber or Postmates if, you know, the government really was to take on that role of providing people health care, providing people a universal basic income? You know, I mean, it doesn't sound as horrible uh, driving for Uber if, if that's all you have to do and you have your uh, everything else paid for by the government and your health care taken care of. Do you think there's uh, these companies could, you know, kind of adapt to a more social democratic uh, system here? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if if everything all planned, like is executed and happens, then yes, we wouldn't have to worry about these types of conversations. And that would be amazing. But unfortunately, we it's going to take some time to get there. So while we get there, we still need to take care of existing current conditions that are happening of and not just continue pushing for future. So like kind of another analogy with that is people are like, David, are you for a federal jobs guarantee or for you for a UPI? Like, or I mean, um, what was it? Uh, yeah, it's that or whether it be the 15 minimum wage, like everybody needs a living wage. But it's like until we get to that point where a UBI is sufficient for us to not have to like work, like people need jobs. You can't just live on a UBI, even if passed at $1,000. And so I, I don't think it's a black or white thing. I think it depends on where we're at during each situation in time. So it's, it's very important for us to still be talking about this while also still talking about future changes that we need to make with UBI and issues like that. So. And I was just going to uh, ask if uh, you had any a final message that you wanted to leave listeners with. And um, if not, we were just going to ask people or ask you where people can go to support you. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, we are definitely the next AOC. And I know it's a big, big statement I'm making, but we are the next AOC versus Joe Crowley race to watch. We are, I'm a pro strong progressive Democrat running against a corporate incumbent. Uh, we have a very strong chance at winning. Um, in our jungle primary, again, as some of you have heard, um, we, uh, we won second place out of five candidates. We won a collective 48%. The incumbent only won a 52%. That's super low for an incumbent. Um, slowly, his, his voting percentages have been chipping down. Last election, it was 70. Now it's 52. Um, so it's really a numbers game, and that's what we've realized. And we're not in it just to play around. We're in it to really win it. We're serious because people's lives are at stake. Um, and so when somebody asks, hey, what are you? 
what's next after this? It's like, what do you mean what's next? Like, this is the only way that we're going because people are suffering right now. Um, so we have a real strong chance. Go check out davidkim2020.com. Um, if you want to volunteer remotely, if you live in Florida, Maine, wherever, you can still volunteer. Text bank, phone bank for us. Um, it's davidkim2020.com forward slash volunteer or donate. And then also a last announcement. Today we have um, uh, the Yang Gang, we have supporters from the Tulsi side, from the Bernie side, from, from all sides, Marianne's, but the Yang Gang today, and, and they love them, they, they are doing a money bomb, Kim money bomb hashtag on Twitter, um, where they're doing a money bomb all day. Their goal is to raise 20000 for the day. Um, there's about four hours and 33 minutes left. So go to davidkim2020.com forward slash money bomb. Go drop a dollar, three dollars, any amount helps, and it allows us to reach out to a few more constituents through text banks and calls. Awesome. awesome. It was so good talking to you today, David. Yeah. Really wish you luck. Thanks, man. We really appreciate it. Cool. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, yeah. take care.